Okay, cool. Hey guys, how are you? Can you hear me? You can hear? Okay, too easy. Hi guys, so we'll just get started. So we're just running the EMQ session for you. So hi, I'm Sean and this is Sachi. So we're from Wisdom. So we're running some questions um, for you guys. So just for a start, can we get on Socrative so that we you know, can answer and just see how you guys do with all the questions on your phone or whatever. You good? All right, cool. So room um, limb uh, 3064. So just a disclaimer, we're going to be going through exam questions today. We're not going to be going through, uh, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about the OSCE, but today we're mainly going to go through exam questions. Um, women's health questions tend to be very difficult. And so this is um, sort of, I guess, the highest yield content to study for the exam. So it's really important to study the exam well. Um, and so all the questions are written by the two of us and other members of the committee. And um, there will be some resemblance to exam questions because we tried to keep the style similar. Okay, so we'll start the first question. Oh, yeah, yeah. 3064, limbs 3064. You're going to try to talk to see if they can hear you. Huh? You guys all right? Let's just see how many people just all tap. I'll check to see. It's the first question we got. If we just like scroll down, yeah. like we keep scrolling, and then we'll just do next and then we yeah. finish, and it goes on the next question. Cool. Okay. So, oh, some people already answered. Okay. Um, are you guys good? Cool. So let's go through the first question, guys. Cool. So we're starting up with like a few warm up questions before we go into like the really difficult. So these, the first ones will be shorter questions. Yeah. So Ray is a 34 year old banker who attends a GP for a pap smear and repeat script for a COCP. She mentions that she's been having migraines of aura every two months. Her partner has a latex allergy. She describes she dislikes needles and the idea of invasive contraception, which is the most suitable contraceptive you would recommend. So it's either Myrina continue her or implant non condoms or suck the progesterone pill. Cool. And people should be good with that one. We're done. So, how do we do? Yeah, really straightforward. Anyone have any questions on this one? <coughs> Sorry, could you? Uh, yeah, yeah well, question. So I think uh, if it's an ask you approach, it'll be different because then you'll give them options. Uh, whereas here, if you have to pick the best answer, I think the latex allergy is kind of pointing away from condoms. So I think you'd go with the POP. Yeah. For the exam purposes, yeah. Yeah. And obviously, you can't do the COCP because you've got migraines of aura, and I think you all know that. So, yeah. So here are some. Yeah, you don't know. yeah so these are just the contraindications to know um, for COCP, which I'm sure you guys already know. Uh, but there's a list there for you to refer to if you need as well. So second question. Folate intake preconception will reduce the risk of which of the following congenital abnormality? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Did that like kick some people out? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's just check real quick. So yeah, uh, myeloma meninges, myeloma meninges. Yeah. 
because um, yeah, well, that's a small yeah, it's a part of bifida, yeah. which is what folate prevents. So it doesn't really do anything with the other ones. We good? I should gloss over these quick. Yeah. So a thirty-year-old well, woman at forty-one weeks gestation is in labor. The baby's head is delivered. Um, shoulders unable to deliver shoulders. So what's the first intervention? Oh. I might, yeah, I might. Oh, we have some slides in between, so that's why, yeah. I'm just clicking that sense right away. <laughs> cool. So yeah, so McRoberts Maneuver. So you follow the helper's acronym to try and get yourself through it, yeah. Next, yeah, just let me do next verse. So you need to know this for obviously the written exam, but you also need to be prepared to explain this in the OSCE. Yeah. So call for help, evaluate, and then the legs, so McRoberts, and then everything else as well. So you need to know this last line is less important to know. Yeah, and just know that the McRoberts maneuver should resolve like 90% of the cases of shoulder dystocia. So it's the first and the most effective thing you can do. Will these slides be uploaded? Yeah, afterwards, yeah. yeah. So you've got like 40 questions. We're going to upload some supplementary questions as well. So uh, which of these has the lowest? We've got 40, but I'm going to go through all of them. We'll see how we go for time. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Which has the lowest failure rate? I think my cut off is 100. After 100, I'm just going to go. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, okay, we'll go back to slide. Yeah, yeah. Wait, can I just. Oh, we'll go oh, next after. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Let's do that. Damn. So the answer is in Panon. So these are the relative efficacies of all the contraceptive options. So it'll be a good idea to get yourself familiar with this table. Um, because they have in the past asked questions and it's a, uh, at least, um, by the end of the year, I hope that it's, it'll be well known amongst you that Implanon has by far the best efficacy. That's why it's very common as well. Used among young, young patients. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, I mean, I don't think you have to remember the exact percentages, just know which ones are the most effective. Um, and understand that tubal ligation, even though it sounds effective, is probably not the most effective compared to the other ones. So you guys have this question, right? So a 32-year-old uh, GGP on woman, 24 weeks pregnant, presents to rural medical center, cough, shortness of breath, right side chest pain, worsens of deep inhalation. She does not have calf pain and swelling in her legs. So two weeks ago, she had a high fever, which resolved. And these are her, her examination findings. So what's the next best step? Waiting for that. All right, let's see how we did. Wow. So about a quarter of you guys. Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously the first thing you have to identify in this question is that there is a risk of this patient having pulmonary embolus, right? So that's the first thing we recognize. After that, then we have to recognize is her status, her risk level, and then what's the best management in a pregnant patient. So when you, so this is the RCOG guideline on how to manage um, thrombolysis in pregnancy. So the first thing you do when you suspect a PE, in this case, she didn't have any like 
calf pain or anything. So that's just putting the question to throw you guys off. Um, but the first thing that we do is we have to assess the patient. And on top of that, regardless of what the assessments come back with, we commence them on Clexane, okay? And, and then you start to assess and you perform your scans afterwards, depending on not whether or not she has DVT. So in this case, she would have no DVT, no symptoms or signs. And then is the chest rate acting abnormal? And then you either perform a CTP or VQ scan after. So I can understand why some of you guys would have picked uh, the VQ scan, obviously, because she's pregnant. But yeah, any questions? Sorry, guys. Contraindication of, oh, well, like, for example, warfarin is contraindicated. In this case, clexane is okay to give in pregnancy. So what was your question is like, what are the contra... Oh, yeah, so like there are a whole bunch of different complications. Like, um, I'm actually not familiar with this, but... Yeah. But basically, like, clexane is contraindicated, like, for example, in, like, well, I think you're going to have to read the book, but I'm not too sure. But there are, like, for example, if you have, like, MI or, like, other, other symptoms, but... Yeah, I'm not too sure, sorry about that. But yeah. Yeah, we had a question. Yeah, yeah because, um, well, you, you know the reason why, right? Because obviously it can dull, dull your results. But yeah, you, put, you do a CTPA. Um, obviously, though, the first thing you do is you put, uh, commence treatment. So that's why the answer was low molecular weight heparin. Yeah. 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 So it's here. All right. We good? I think I have to go to the next question. This is a little annoying. Okay. So 22 year old nulliparous woman with history of PID arrives with nausea, abdominal pains, vaginal bleeding. She's worried she might be pregnant because she had unprotected sexual intercourse two months ago. Um, and these are her exams. So she has a tender, rigid abdomen, especially in the right lower, uh, lower quadrant. So what's the next step? So the answer is serum beta HCG. So did some of you guys arrange an emergency laparoscopy because it seemed like she was hemodynamically unstable? Is that why? Yeah. So you can see from her examination results, she's actually like not that bad. Like her blood pressure is still fine. Um, O2 sets are okay. Temperature, heart rate, respirate, they're all like within relatively normal ranges. So she is hemodynamically stable. So, um, so when they're hemodynamic, sorry, yeah. So, so in this case, right, we've got, we've got symptoms of not peritonitis, but well, tenor rigid, rigid abdomen in the right lower quadrant. What she has is she has, um, obviously risk of ectopic, right? That's what we're worried about. The first thing we do is when we manage that, First of all, she's hemodynamically stable, right? If she's hemodynamically unstable, then obviously you perform the emergency laparoscopy straight away. That's your first thing. That's in the exam questions where you do. If she's hemodynamically, if her, if her vitals are okay, which is what we've shown in this question, then we either perform a beta HCG or transvaginal ultrasound, right? Um, and the, basically the prompt guidelines, have any of you guys read prompt? Prompt guidelines should be that um, the first thing you do is a serum beta HCG. And at the same time, you ideally want to perform an ultrasound. And then you repeat that again, uh, and you just see that that's just see confirm whether or not she has an ectopic. Okay. 
Exactly, yeah. yeah. You do that all at the same time, yeah, exactly. But in this case, that's the number one diagnosis. So, and, and she's, I think the main thing is she's hemodynamically stable. So we don't need to rush to perform any, any surgery, yeah. That's okay, so you treat first and then you investigate after when you have a suspected PE. So if you look here, these are, these are the guidelines. The first thing you do is you obviously can, you perform your investigations, but you commence low molecular weight heparin straight away. And then afterwards, you do all the scans. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So you performed the serum beta HCG for this patient and the results were 1,300 and the ultrasound shows empty uterus, minimal, uh, minimal free fluid and a two by two centimeter ectopic. So how do you manage this patient? So I'm only having to tap every single time. If she can help me, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So let's have a look. Wow, okay. So I see that people here haven't been reading prompt yet. So, <laughs> no. I, I did that then at the end of the year as well. So, um, okay, so basically the first thing we see here is that from our so from our examination results, our investigation results, we've got a beta HCG of 1,300, which is less than 1,500. And we have our, in our ultrasound, we can see uh, an ectopic sac that's less than five centimeters and minimal free fluid and empty uterus. So these are all key points. So I know that these are criteria for, for, for medical management, but the, what we have to do first is, before we even manage them, we have to repeat the beta HCG every 48 hours until it's over 1,500. So on the next slide, nope, not on the next slide. I'll explain, I'll explain later. So now you've, now you've had that result and then you, you perform a repeat beta HCG, it's now 5,000. how we did okay so okay guys so this is how you manage an ectopic pregnancy okay so if as I mentioned before if they're hemodynamically unstable you immediately organize a laparoscopy if they are stable then you have to perform beta HCG and an ultrasound for them if their beta HCG is less than 1500 IU you have to follow up every 48 hours until it's over that value. Does it make sense? And if it ever gets over that value, that's when you confirm. And, and obviously if you've got ultrasound confirmation as well, then you have to manage that. And by managing that, over 5,000, for example, is a contraindication for medical management. 
Yeah. This is all on prompt. Okay. So, um, <laughs> surgical management, no, 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 I'm just saying, so surgical management is usually the first line of managing patients. So usually even in uh, the exam questions, if they give you an option of medical and surgical without any contraindication to medical management, the answer is actually surgical most of the time, unless they've given you a specific reason why a patient doesn't want surgery. Does that make sense? Yep. You mean like um, it doesn't so change the fact? Because um, yeah, yeah. Because um, when you've got when you have um, a beta HDG of under one thousand five hundred, that's usually an indication that's a very very small topic. A lot of those at the very preliminary stages can resolve on their own. So you have to keep performing beta HCG every 48 hours until it's at the level for which we manage them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they can... Yeah. Well, 1,500 is actually a very low threshold. So, but um, yeah, that's the guideline. So I would follow that when I approach the questions. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. yeah. That's the idea. Very low. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that that answers the question. Yeah. And um, the indications for medical management for methotrexate is something that you'll have to remember for the exam as well. So that's under eight weeks gestational. If you're any above, then you can't. You have to perform surgery and beta HCG of less than five thousand on top of ultrasound findings, ectopic sac less than five centimeters and no fetal heart. Um, can we, this is a bit annoying. Okay. So a happily married 33 year old woman presents to your clinic with vaginal bleeding. This has been happening for the past few days and is accompanied by passage of products. Um, she has a history of ischemic heart disease and severe asthma. Her lower last known menstrual period was nine weeks ago. What's the best management? Oh. Can you read the question? Yeah, I think it's Yeah, yeah. Like on the Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Let's have a look how we did. Wow. Okay. No, that's a good shot, actually. Um. So, so in this case, right? Wait. Did I mess up? Oh, oh, that was that was my mistake. That was my mistake. Yeah. That was my mistake. That's all. I was like, wait, that sounds right. Um, the answer is this: is expected management. Yeah. You guys are right. Sorry. That was my bad. You know, like copying and pasting everything in the socket. Um. So yeah, so that's really good. So and, and the main idea here is that obviously in most cases we will try to manage with misoprostol as first line. However, in this particular instance, we actually, she actually has two contraindications to it. So she's got ischemic heart disease and she's got severe asthma, which in the prompt guidelines those are two contraindications. So here again, um, what to manage a miscarriage? The management is either expected management, medical management. In this case, only in hemodynamically stable, obviously, and who can comply. And these are some of the um, contraindications if, of which MI and severe asthma were both in the question. And um, surgical management for other patients. It's either suction curate or DNA. 
we skip the next question? Yeah. Okay, so a lady is coming for a routine antenatal exam at 32 weeks. Um, she's at mostly ex uh, normal examinations, but her BSLs are high and physiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophysiophys
time and then raise the question and take this question. I know I wrote this question, but I hope I did. Because if we didn't, <laughs> yeah, I would just say my money. I think that was, um, I, I, I think from the previous question, I'm not sure if I, maybe I made a mistake, but. Um, members are not yet ruptured. Okay, membranes have not yet ruptured. That's my bad, yeah, my bad. I was meant to say that her membranes have ruptured in this question, but so in this case, you would be right. But if they, if they have ruptured, then oxytocin, yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Sorry? Oh, that, um, so that's a good point. That's a very good point. Well, either way, apparently the answer is amniotomy. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a good point. So um, in multi pass women, we tend to avoid it, but sometimes if there's a delay in labor, then we still provide it. It's just that that's, it's not an absolute contraindication, if you know what I mean. Sorry. So she made that if she's multi paris, um, you shouldn't give her oxytocin. It's just that it's not an absolute contraindication. But the answer in this case, because I didn't clarify that her membranes have ruptured, and that was my bad. But um, so the answer in this case was amniotomy. Okay, are we all right? Let's go next question. Okay, guys. So G1P0 presents at 35 weeks gestation with three minutely contractions. On vaginal exam shows dilation, uh, soft mid position dilated eight centimeters, one centimeter length, station plus one. Membranes have ruptured. CCG shows early D cells and normal variability. So what's the next step in management? We have to, well, we have to get So I can see someone celebrating back there. Um, yeah, so, wait, no, that's not it, yeah. So she's preterm, therefore we should provide IV antibiotics. Does that make sense? Yep. So, so if, you, if someone's preterm, right, pre, so it means she's got pre-prom, right? Um, the first line, the first thing we have to do is you have to give her IV antibiotics, yeah. Yeah, so you give her benten? Yeah, benten, yeah? No, no, no. Uh, erythromycin. erythromycin. Yeah, you give her erythromycin. Yeah. Do you have another question? Yeah. We don't have questions? Okay, cool. So this is related to the past three. Yeah, we have a question. Did you hear the question? Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, 
So if 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 it's imminent. Yeah, yeah, just to prevent it because I have a case like pulling it out and then seeing Yeah. Um so yeah, no, that's a different thing entirely. That's not P prom. Sorry? Oh, I, I, I see your yeah, yeah, I see your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. So what she's saying is that if there's spontaneous uh, if there's spontaneous labor, then this is not this is not how you well you would still give her a Ben pen because now she's in labor as opposed to erythromycin. However, uh, yeah, I think I think the, this question I, I left out a piece of information that was important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ben pen instead of erythromycin. Sorry, we have another question. Yeah, if, if the, the, uh, the information is not provided, you assume that that's the case. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so, so, so this is, um, so the causes of prolonged labor, so this is actually really important. Um, so obviously you know that the three Ps, right? We've got passage, passenger. If either it's, if it's either those two, you obviously have to perform a cesarean because you can't try and force the baby out of a hole it can't fit through. Um, if you, if it's powers, if that's the issue, then what you do is you, you wait for two hours and then you do a repeat vaginal exam. So if in that, in that the first vaginal exam and the second vaginal exam after two hours is inadequate progress, that's your measure in your partogram, then you diagnose and then you perform, you know, you perform your management strategies. So if you ever suspect it, uh, so that, then, then again, you'll do another vaginal exam, another two hours. If again, there's not, enough progress, that's when you have to resolve yourself and do a cesarean. For prolonged second stage, it depends on, um, it really depends on whether you're a nolly purse or multi purse. So if you've been in second stage for more than an hour and if you haven't had a child before, then um, that's when you, uh, that's when you suspect it, basically. Um, so then you perform another vaginal exam, you if not already ruptured, you perform amniotomy, and then you try to manage her with basically like just moving her and just doing a lot of like manual, uh, manual non-medical changes. In the second stage, if it's over two hours, so basically double for both, that's when you manage her with instrumental delivery or in certain situations, you actually use oxytocin. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay, so 24 year old G1P0 women has had normal screening throughout pregnancy. She's now in 14 weeks and she's noticed blood in her underwear. Group, blood group is O negative without antibodies and it's unknown what her partner's blood group is. So this is an anti-D question. What's the next best step in management? Let's have a look to see how we did. All right, good job. So 12 hours and 72 hours, it's just um, the only difference is, well, 12 hours is not really a thing. Um, and so, so if they give you an option between the two times, you always pick 72 hours because the guidelines state that you should provide NTD within 72 hours. Um, and so in this case, she is at 14 weeks of gestation, meaning that she's over 12 weeks. So you give her 625 instead of 250. Okay, yeah, real quick, Hannah. Yeah, so you perform a Kleihauer if the patient is over 20 weeks of gestation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is that no more questions? Okay, cool. 
I guess that kind of answers the next question, or maybe not. Let's have a look. Did you do it away? Yeah. I don't even remember my own questions. Nah, I think this is the uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so a 28-year-old woman, G3P1, O negative blood, no antibodies, normal scans, currently at 11 weeks gestation. Her dating scan a week ago shows lambda sign. She recently noticed some bleeding in the pads and arrived to the hospital for a checkup. How do we manage her in terms of NTD? Do you see him? Like a guy No, no, no. A uh, guy like two. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Legit. He just looks like he wore those two people together. I, saw, I was like, wait. No. And I was like, wait. <laughs> Doesn't he know? Yeah. Let's have a look. So some of you guys said 250, others did 625. So that's the answer. So the, the, the reason is this is under 12 weeks. So normally we give patients 250 IUs. However, she has lambda signs. So she's got twin pregnancy. When a patient has twin pregnancy, the guidelines say that we should provide 625, even if they are under 12 weeks. Okay. Yeah. So all of this is on prompt and it's a good idea to Get familiar, familiarize yourself before the written exam. Yeah. Does the timing of the flight hour change based on the assignment? No. No. Oh no. Um, I think it's the same. It's it's still six to twenty-five. Yeah. It's just that in under twelve weeks, then that's that's the only time you change your management. Yeah. Yeah. So we're good. This was actually like adapted. It's kind of like, yeah, this is like, um, how do I say this? This is very similar to the questions that came up two years ago. Yeah, so uh, I think two years ago there was, um, there was a set of eight questions or something like that, that was NTD, the reason why we put these questions in, um, that were similar in difficulty and people either knew it or they didn't. So if they didn't read the specific guideline on everything, like, like, for example, anti-D, like obviously the high yield stuff, but the, even the nitty gritty stuff like this, right? If you didn't read that, then you'd get all those eight questions wrong because there were so many options. Either you get them all wrong or get them all right. So that's why it's important to read prompts. Yeah. So I guess in essence, your answer, the answer is that this would be the highest, the more, most difficult type of question you get on the exam, but it could come up. Yep. I guess so, like this stuff, yeah. They probably do, yeah. I would guess. The yeah. fire hour. So if you're over 20 weeks, you do apply how regardless. Um, regardless of whether or not you've got a twin pregnancy or a normal pregnancy, yeah. Is that the question? Maddie, is that a question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's have a look. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Oh, yeah. So he's got your questions now. I'll just, I'll just sort this out. So, oh, as in you want to? I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah. So, okay, so the next question. So, 32 year old woman just delivered a healthy baby boy two hours ago at 39 weeks gestation. So she is rhesus negative. She's had a routine anti-D at 28 and 34 weeks. Cord blood analysis shows that she still has anti-D. Her partner's blood group is O positive. What's the next best step? So she, she just delivered. So these are quite difficult. Um, 
but they're all on prompt. So, yeah. I thought your question stopped at 15, but they don't because we added the 5% yeah, at the start. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I was like, right, 19. And then I was yeah, like, yeah. Was a question for you just like this particular stuff we just escaped. Uh, I don't know, it's not yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so it was kind of split. So, this is again just from directly from prompt. So, um the guidelines state that if after delivering in all pregnancies, you perform the Klaihauer and you give 625, and then the Klaihauer test is actually just used to determine if you need any additional anti-D. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Monash prompt. <laughs> oh, which guideline? Oh, oh so, so there's, a, there's a Monash guideline on anti-D, rhesus negative. Oh. Control F. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Okay. So next question. So. Yes. No, no, no. All pregnancies are recent negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so next question. Uh, Missy, a 28-year-old woman, has just given birth to and is currently breastfeeding her first child of a few months age. So she would like to continue engaging in intercourse with a partner. In the past, she has used Barry and OCP. She would like to have another baby in a year's time. How do we manage? <laughs> <laughs> so for these questions like we've actually tried to have like some contentious questions just so that we can clarify the more difficult exam related questions so don't stress if these are very difficult Sorry, guys, you have a question. Sorry? Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, you haven't specified how old. Oh, sorry, has just a few months ago. So a few months ago. Yep. Yeah. It depends. If it's six months or less, it changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to say, yeah, you have to do it. So less than six months then. Less than six months. I mean, it's Yeah, because less than six months, you can't give CSC people the yeah. that you can. So then if, it's, if they're more than six months, you can just go to CSC people. Yeah. So, so yeah, basically, basically she's breastfeeding, so you can't give her the COCP. She would like to have another baby in a year's time. Are we good with that one? A Marina, because she would like to have a baby. Like, I mean, it's just a lot easier if you know well, what I mean. Like, you want to take it out. Yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah. So a lot of these are like, um, there's no guidelines, but you just get the feel from it from the questions. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say common sense. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we have more questions. Yeah.
but she's still breastfeeding. Not while she's breastfeeding, no. I didn't hear that one. Sorry, was there another question? Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff you guys don't need to know. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's obviously good to know. It's good to know. Yeah. All right. There's another question. Yeah. Yeah, so when we wrote this question, we had progesterone as an option, and then we thought that might confuse people. Um, so that, that would be an option as well. Uh, that's why we haven't given it here. In an OSCE, you would, you would offer them Barry and, and POP. Yeah. Like, Yeah, it would be. Yeah, that was a question before. Yeah, so, so we, took, we, we, we took it out because it would be contentious. Yeah. So Jeanette is a 38-year-old woman with three children. She has suffered from painful and heavy menstrual bleeding for most of her life. She is currently using the COCP for contraception, but she'd like to stop it because she's had steady weight gain over the past five years. So how do we manage her? Did you count? So, okay. uh, I just uh, wouldn't assume there is. Could be. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe like. Nice. Wow. Well done. Uh, yeah, so my arena is good because it's actually like the best, if not one of the best um, managements for um, heavy bleeding. Um, and also in this case, she's had weight gain. She doesn't, she wants to stop the COCP. So yeah, my arena doesn't really cause much of that. So that's the best management. So. Oh. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, so you do that as well on top of your marginal, of course, yeah. I guess, like, with these questions, like, a lot of the time you've got to infer the answer being practice and it's not reasonable what the answers are. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, is this yours? No, that's mine. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. Any more questions for that one? So 28-year-old Sarah and her husband has arrived in your infertility clinic has, have, because they've been trying to conceive for 14 months. Um, she's had a history of menstrual irregularities and her abdominal pelvic exam is normal. As an adolescent, she suffered from acne, acne, which is now resolved. So what should we investigate? <coughs> I'm not sure if this is like a really hard question or a really easy question. Like, I never know. I never tell. I feel like it might be a hard question. 
Cool. That's actually, that's really good. Yeah. So um, in this case, um, so the mid luteal progesterone, so what the mid luteal progesterone does is it helps you check if a patient's ovulating. In this case, she's had irregular menstrual periods and all else is normal. So the first thing we'll do is to see if she is um, ovulating. So the best investigation for just normal an an ovulation is mid luteal progesterone. So if you're getting hints of that in the exam, that's what you pick. Yeah. You'd have to ask your doctor. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Sorry. Does anyone have any questions about that one? Cool. Um, actually, I just want to explain something else as well. So, does anyone here know what the progesterone challenge test is? Do you guys know what it is? Like the withdrawal test? So, basically what it is, is it's a test that obviously, so you give patient progesterone, you give it for seven days, and then you take it away from them. What happens is that if they are ovulating, then uh, if they've got issues with ovulation, for example, that means they still have um, a good amount of estrogen in their system, then they will develop the endometrium and then they'll have a withdrawal bleed after you take away the progesterone. If they have something like a, like something more like higher up in the axis, that results in, you know, they don't have as much estrogen anyway. So they don't actually develop the endometrium and they won't have a withdrawal bleed. So it's a good test to, to determine the cause of the patient's infertility, if you know what I mean. So if they do have a withdrawal bleed, what you're thinking about is normal an ovula ovulation or like PCOS or something like that. Yeah. So these are the causes of infertility. I'm sure someone else has gone through this. Do you have the next question up? So 19-year-old Amy has had irregular periods for the past year. Before this, she has been depressed due to breaking up with a long-time boyfriend. In addition to this, she has noticed an increase in hair growth on her face and other areas. What investigation should be ordered? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. I think we can finish it for probably. Okay. We'll finish it for. So. I think so. Okay, so everyone is thinking in the same line, right? So this patient might have PCOS. So um, she has had irregular periods of the past year. She uh, broke up with her boyfriend. So again, this question has like assumption that she stopped the COCP or something like that. So, um, and she has noticed an increase in, <laughs> increase in hair growth in her face and other areas. So for, uh, this is just something, um, again, in the guidelines for PCOS, it's not on prompts, but this was from up to date. It's, it, and, and it was, I think, the answer for one of the past year's questions as well. So the first, first line, gold standard, well, first line investigation, if you're gonna do an investigation for PCOS, is total testosterone plus minus free testosterone. Um, and then the polycystic ovaries 
but she already has a clinical time to hide that aggregate from humans. And so to give us like an extra um, like criteria, wouldn't we go with an ovulation and do it like if we do progesterone? <laughs> No, that's a, that's a really good point. I didn't really think that far into it. So um, I, I just, yeah, I think a lot of times in the exam questions, they're just looking, they're just telling you what the diagnosis is and then how do you investigate that, that diagnosis? They're not, that they're not looking at that. That's more like a clinical practice, if you know what I mean. So we're not giving us the full picture in, in this question. It's not the whole, the, we're not painting the whole canvas. Yeah. So I read another question. Was that a question or? No, no that wasn't a question, okay. That's yours? Yeah, okay. You got it. I'll just on the Okay. Yeah. All right, so we have a 27 year old G1 P1. She's got asthma. She uh, just gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Uh, she was given oxytocin at, at delivery of the anterior shoulder, uh, but she's continued to bleed even after delivery of the placenta. And so she's diagnosed with PPH. Um, and so the question is asking what medications you diminish as first line therapy. PPH. Okay, so um, this one's a bit of a mean question, but it's off prompt as well. Um, so for management of PPH, you have a few first line medications, uh, but because she's got a history of asthma, anything that has ergometrin is contraindicated. So you can't give sintometrin or you can't give ergometrin. Uh, so then your choice really comes down to oxytocin. And I've given two options there. Uh, you give five units IV or you can give 10 units IM. So C is wrong, and then so you're left with B. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is the question. Yeah. Actually, no. Hey, where's the next one? No one's answering yeah, no. Sorry, just with uh, this one, just remember, um, it's important to remember the other contraindications for ergometrin as well. Um, like, so hypertension, cardiac disease, PVD, or placenta in situ, because that can get, uh, that can come up as well. Okay, so next one is 26 year old G1P1, presenting with decreased freedom movements, uh, 30 weeks. Um, so maternal vital signs are within normal range, uterus is non-tender. Um, fetus is in that position, SFH is 29, what's the most appropriate next step? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, it's just like, do you want peas or you said you want? Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just like, do you want P1? Just go to zero. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah. All right, Sam. Uh, good. Some people good. It's a hard question. Yeah, it's a very hard question. Yeah. Yeah. So again, this is a hard question. Um. So CTG would be the next step, but the first thing you have to do, this is off prompt as well. I feel like this whole question thing is to highlight how important prompt is. Um, so yeah, so decrease fetal movements. The first thing you do is you examine. And so I gave you some of the examination findings, but I didn't tell you anything about auscultation with a handle or Doppler. So that's the first thing you do. Um, and if you find the heart there, then you go into a CTG. Um, so the flow chart is just here. So it would be good to have a look through that when you guys get a chance. So I just want to point out, all this stuff seems really low yield, I know, but um, this stuff does come up. It came up in an OSCE, I think, the year before us. So two years before you, um, and obviously a lot of people messed it up because nobody, not many people studied this. So it is actually quite important to try and read um, as many of the guidelines as you can. Yeah, you good? Next cool. question. Any questions? Okay, so 29-year-old G1P0 found to have a breach at 36 weeks, and she's uh, about to undergo ECV, which of the following will be a contraindication to performing ECV. Because I was like, what? 15 questions of just like this level? <laughs> no, nah, like, it's, it's hard to write questions at the beginning, so I was like, got to base it off prompt. So, yeah. Yeah, right. uh, that's good. Um, all right, so yeah, thank prompt again for that question. Um, so it's contraindicated. So this is again found on prompt. Uh, these are the absolute contraindications. Um, all the other answers that I've listed, you can still perform ECV. You just have to be more careful. Um, so yeah. Um, so 29-year-old G2P1 presenting with painful genital lesions, diagnosed with herpes at 35 weeks. So she's never had purpose before, and she's been otherwise well. What's the most appropriate management? Actually, the 
Uh, okay. Yeah, good. Okay. So, um, so if you've got if you've got herpes in in pregnancy, the management changes depending on whether you get it in whether it's primary or secondary or recurrent, um, and whether you get it in the first or second trimester or the third trimester. So if it's in the third trimester, you're at uh, a higher risk of passing it on to your baby. So then you have to deliver through cesarean, and you have to be given acyclovir. Make sense? Cool. Um, so, 30 year old sexually active lady comes to you for a cervical screening test for the first time. She's never had any pap smear in the past. Um, the CSC comes back positive for a non 1618 HPV. Uh, reflex LBC is performed and that returns negative. What's the most appropriate next step? So I'll explain this question after we do the next one, which is also another CSD one. So a 30 year old lady comes from CSD after having normal tax for two years ago. Um, again, the CSD is positive for 91618, and this one returns positive for LSIL. What's the most appropriate next step? So the point of those two questions is to just basically highlight that they have the same management pathway. So this is from the cervical screening guidelines. Um, if it's HPV non 1618, regardless of uh, whether the LBC is negative or LSIL, you just repeat it in 12 months. You only have to refer for colposcopy if it's HSIL. Yeah. Um, if it's HPV 16 or 18, um, then you go straight to colposcopy. Cool. So because the guidelines only changed like last year or the year before, you're pretty much guaranteed to get a question on CSCs or even two. So it's important to uh, study this. Uh, 32 year old primary gravity has presented for her 28 week checkup. She's got chronic hep B. Uh, most recent blood test shows low viral load, LFT is a normal, which of the following is not an appropriate management option. So what would you not do in a patient with hep B? It's three thirty. See how you Very good. Uh, switch back. We'll just go next first. Okay, switch. 
Um, yeah, so a similar question was asked in one of the past exams, which is why I included this one. Um, basically, if you've got Hep B, uh, you should do all the other things. Um, you're, so a cesarean, you don't need a cesarean section. If you've got Hep B, you can deliver normally um, and you can still breastfeed. Um, so those are kind of red herrings there. Um, but you can't do a fetal scalp electrode because um, that can increase the risk of transmission. Uh, and that's off. Um, this is from Ranscog, so there's a guideline on that as well. So this, uh, yeah, 32 year old presented with SHROM, so spontaneous rupture of membranes four days ago, was induced 20, two hours ago. 30 minutes into active second stage, the fetal heart, heart is unable to be picked up by the CTG, which of the following is not an ab absolute contraindication to applying a fetal scalp monitor. So you already know one of the answers. Today? Sorry, that was, a, that was a bit of a mean one as well. Um, so these are the contraindications to applying a scalp electrode. Uh, if it's a breach, you actually can still do it. You just need um, a consultant to do it, but you can still apply. Whereas all the other ones, you, you, they're contraindicated. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, good question. I guess it putting a scalp electrode is quite pretty invasive as well, so you don't want to basically concur more risk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're a GP, and your next patient is a healthy 26 year old who has just found out she's pregnant. Today is her booking visit. Which investigation would you not routinely perform? Even if you have it on two screens, like we'll also have to scroll between the two screens to like navigate this one. That's it? true, that's true. Oh, but it should be fun because if it's dual screen, you can just move your mouse and it doesn't yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's still annoying, yeah. but yeah. Cool, seems like people are comfortable in this one. Oh, or not. Okay. Um, all right, so. So, again, this is. This is off prompt. Um, so in at um, at Monash, which is basically what the questions are going to be from the exam, you do uh, an electrophoresis in all women. Uh, all the other ones here. So th this is the list you have to remember to do for all women, and these are the ones you only do if they're high risk. So you would only do a TSH if they have a previous history of thyroid disease or something like that. Um, and you do STI screening for all women under 25, but she's 26, so you won't have to do that. Um, but yeah, so electrophoresis is something that's done always. Yeah. I would I would try to remember 
uh, some of these to say in your OSCE because there is a chance if you give you a booking visit as well. There's a question. Yeah. Um, good question. I'm not sure whether it will be asked uh, as like an MCQ. It could come from the OSCE and I think you'd get marked for saying do, do an electrophoresis here. Um, well, what, I do, what we do know is that Monash writes the exams and so they base their guidelines for the women's health questions off prompt. So there's a very good chance that this could be an option in one of the questions. And it wouldn't be the answer if you know what I mean. Yeah. But th these are hard questions. They're just meant to highlight sort of areas maybe maybe you guys need to look into. So it's a 23, 26% now. Wow. All right. Okay. Um, so you're a medical student at an antenatal clinic. The consultant asked you to identify factors of silver. Which of the following would you not list? I think so that should say. Um, that should say. BMI over 25. That. I think we all saw that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Go back. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. What? Why, why? What's interesting? Like, as in, I thought more people. I know, yeah. Interested. People start to read questions. Yeah, I think people just. Uh, Maybe um go back to the main slide so they can see those two answers. Yeah. Sorry. What is um, how do you go I just remember the list. I'm not even completely remember. Cool. Good. Have I seen Yeah. So, um, miscarriage doesn't increase your risk of stillbirth. So, it's normal to have one miscarriage and your risk of, you know, subsequent miscarriages are still the same. And so, the same applies to stillbirth. So, it's not a risk factor. Um, and the full list of prompt is here. Um, yeah. Any questions? I have a question. Sorry. This guideline. Um, so that's Monash. Like the name for the guideline. Oh. Um, I'll have to look that. I'll, I'll look it up and tell you after we finish. Okay. Okay. Um, 55 year old woman experiences severe hot flashes that affect her at work. Her periods have been irregular for the last 12 months, lasting two to three days, occurring every one to three months. She has BMI is 35. She's got a 25-pack year history of smoking. What's the most appropriate management for her symptoms? Soft question 31. Mm. Just Just a little bit over that. Oh, that's so cute. Hey. That's a high quality photo. That's really cute. Yes. Early white. Early white. Could be in an ad for that. Oh, 
the discovery. Yeah, good. Good job. Um, so the answer is venlafaxine. Um, so this is from this guideline here, which is uh, really good for menopause management. Um, so if you Moxifen because they can interact, um, but otherwise, that's the best one you would go with. Okay, 30 year old G1P0 presents for a 20 week ultrasound scan. Based on the results, placenta previous suspected, what is the most appropriate step? Next most appropriate step. For a second, I was really confused. I was just like, you don't know what's going on. I was like, how do you know it's AZ? I'm like, wait a minute, have you even done this? Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, true. Yeah. Maybe that gives her the answer, to be honest. Kind of, I guess, yeah. But um, people need to know this stuff, so. I have another question after it. Oh, you do, you do, so it's fine. So, according to prompt, if you suspect placenta previa, uh, because this scan is just a 20 week uh, fetal uh, anomaly scan, so uh, actually, no, I'm not going to explain it because there's another question, so I'll explain after. So, the, oh, okay, yeah. So, the answer there was transmitted last round. So, that confirms a complete placenta previa. What's the most next? What's the next most appropriate step? No, 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 that's it. I don't even think you need to explain anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the previous question, so the way you manage placenta preview if you suspect it is if you pick it up on the 20 week scan, you have to do a transvaginal one to confirm it because it's more accurate. Uh, and then, depending on whether it's a complete or a partial, uh, that determines when you rescan. So if it's a complete, you rescan at uh, 32 weeks. Um, if it's a partial, you can do it at 34 to 36 weeks, which is one of the options. Um, the reason you rescan is because if you have a placenta period of 20 weeks, there's like a 10% chance of it persisting onto birth. But if you pick it up again and it's still there when, uh, in the third trimester, then that, there's a high chance it's going to continue until delivery, in which case you have to do something about it. Um, 22 year old female sex worker um, presenting with three, three days of purulent vaginal discharge. She's had unprotected vaginal intercourse two weeks ago. She's been using the COC for contraception for many years. I know other SCIs in the past. What's the most appropriate investigation? FPU's first pass urine, in case someone didn't know.
Cool. Yeah, good. Um, do I have an explanation? Sorry. No. Okay. Um, so basically, you, you, you're suspecting STI. Uh, if there's so with gonorrhea, chlamydia, how you screen for them? If they're asymptomatic, then you just do a NAT, which is a PCR. Um, if they're symptomatic or they have discharge, then you have to culture that as well. Um, so in females, the first line is an endocervical swab. Um, for males, it's a first pass urine. Cool. Um, the, oh, sorry. Um, where I got these from is if you guys look up Australian STI guidelines, there's a good website which has all the information you need to know on all the STIs. Um, the results come back positive for gonorrhea. What's the most appropriate management? Self defense. What's that? Um, no, that's uh, gonorrhea. Yeah, Kef, uh, oh, yeah. by itself is um, doxia. Or is it? Yeah, but doxia you have to do for seven days because it's very just a one off dose. So then you can really just go for the same drug. Yeah, okay, good. Um, good. So for uh, gonorrhea, you just treat with keftriaxone, azithromycin, that's a cover for chlamydia as well, because that can coexist, and that's just a one-off dose. Uh, in an OSCE, the other things you would do in an STI station, I've just listed here. Um, yeah, I won't go through those, but it's just for OSCE practice, and when we put up the slides, you guys can look over that. Any questions? Uh, 45 year old G3P3 presents for a checkup. The only thing that troubles her is having to get up several times during the night to void. She comes, sometimes cannot quite reach the bathroom in time. She attributes this to getting older and has started to wear a pad when she goes out. Uh, the patient is otherwise healthy. Uh, she has three spontaneous vaginal blues in the past. Urine district NAD. What's the most likely diagnosis? I wish I was more body. I would have taken another body. Oh, really? Yeah. Couldn't have finished the first one. Yeah. yeah. I like, I could barely finish it, but I, just for value, I would take another one. <laughs> yeah. That's good though, right? Like, it's, a, it's a stacked body. And it was like five dollars a person. So really? it's like I can understand why everyone's like doing it. Yeah, it's like a subway. Yeah. It's better than getting a five dollar piece of so mm. It has a better time. Yeah, plus that's true. It runs filled. So. Mm. Very hard this question. Mm. Because mm. they choose it, it's just something you learn later on, you know what I mean? But uh, that's okay. Seems like you should go for it. Yeah, good. Um, so she's got um, urge incontinence, basically, that's what all her symptoms imply. Um, and the most common cause of urge incontinence is the trusa instability. Um, so that's what that question was getting at. Uh, this is also a prompt. So there's a they classify incontinence according to a few different causes. Um, so it might be worth having a look. And then I've just and the buzzwords for urge incontinence are urgency and nocturia. So she's got both those signs. Uh, and just try and um, remember how you manage each one separately. Uh, Laura is a 23-year-old female complaining of dysmenorrhea. She states that her periods have always been painful, but uh, they have become unbearable over the last two to three years. Uh, she takes some NSAIDs, uses a heat pack. Um, yeah. um, her periods are regular. She does not complain of any heavy or interventional bleeding. She used to only get pain in the first four days of her period. Now she has it entire time for several days before and a few days after. 
sexually active with long-term partner uses condoms, but she says she has been avoiding sex that it is painful. She's not on any contraception. No urinary symptoms, hematuria or dysuria, but she often has dysuria during her period. What is the next best step? It's not, what is this question? I didn't even write this question. Who wrote this question? Katie? Katie's one of Katie's questions, yeah. I yeah. Um, Is that time? Um, wait, what's the next best step? Yeah. Was it um? Yeah, it was this, wasn't it? Don't, don't. <laughs> yeah, your cursor is going to go through. Oh, like, oh. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I can't even remember how to explain that. Um, Jingle? No, I'm not sure. Let me just read it again. I should have read this question. So we can do it together. Yeah. Oh, it's simply just the first investigation. That's all it ends up. That's, that's if, if you're pretty sure it's endometriosis and everything else, you're going to do the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, endometriosis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of people don't respond. Yeah, just go for it. Oh. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, so when you're reading this question, you can see that she's got, basically she's got a lot of pain. She has to stay in bed because of her period. There, uh, she, she doesn't complain of any heavy bleeding. Um, but now she's got pain like the whole time. So basically what we're thinking is she might have endometriosis, right? When you've, got, when, when you've got someone with the first diagnosis being endometriosis, doing a transvaginal ultrasound is not really going to tell you much. So you have to do a diagnostic lab. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you, you can, it's just, um, the, well, the only definitive really like the best management again, anyway, is, is to do a diagnostic lab. And then you can, if you find something then you can also treat it. Right. So a lot of times the threshold, if, if your first sus suspicion is endometriosis, usually there's actually a very low threshold to performing. Sorry, I have a question to comment on that, but this is not where you do a diagnostic lab. I don't think there's a guideline on prompt. Yeah, for endometriosis, it's mainly it's just, obstetrics, yeah. but um, yeah. but the first line investigation is that, so that would be the most likely answer in this case. But I mean, I see what you're saying about about the CCP. It helps if you do take it out as well while you're doing the diagnostic lab. Mm. Yeah. So you, I mean, obviously you do a diagnostic lab and then. A lot of doctors, like, they just adjust halfway through, right? They see something in there, so then they treat it as well. But, um, yeah. Well, first of all, you have to confirm the diagnosis, right? So you have to do a diagnostic lab. So do you have a question? Yeah. 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 You check if she, oh, if she's pregnant. Yeah. You would. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. No, that's a good yeah, point. You would. So then I suppose yeah. the question would probably then, it will be easier if I think maybe in the exam they'll say, what is the best investigation as opposed to what's the next best step? Yeah. I know like it's really vague, but yeah. Where? Because um, your first diagnosis is endometriosis. She doesn't have heavy bleeding. So giving her a Mirena isn't going to resolve her issues, if you know what I mean. She just has a lot of pain. She doesn't have heavy bleeding. So you're not thinking like an adenomyosis or anything like that. So, so your next, your first best investigation would be to conduct that. Uh, 
Um, Nineteen-year-old female presenting with suprapubic abdominal pain for one week, which is progressively worsening. She denies any vaginal discharge, uh, has regular normal periods, except for some bleeding between her last two periods. She is sexually active and has had two partners in the last six months, but recently has been avoiding sex because it's become too painful for her. She takes a CSCP for contraception. She's febrile. What sign of physical examination would help best confirm your most likely diagnosis? Scroll through that too. Sorry? Are you gonna like scroll through that? Too? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're at the end. So we didn't need the two hours. Mm. I thought we weren't even gonna. Endometriosis. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's the other issue with like um using other people's questions. Mm. Like you imagine if you write this entire thing on like these questions. A bit higher, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. How do we do? Ah, very good. Yeah, good job. So really straightforward. Um when you read this question, the first <laughs> thing you're thinking about um is she might have PID. So cervical excitation is actually the best sign for that, but I, I understand the other options as well. Just yeah. to run through, so tenderness in the left leg fossa, it's a bit of a vague sign, but that could indicate like a whole bunch of things. It could be an ectopic as well, but that's not really what we're looking for here. Um, thick white discharge, that's mostly bacterial vaginosis. Um, tenderness in the pouch, that can be endometriosis usually, and an enlarged and blocked uterus is a buzzword for uh, adenomyosis. So the, the most likely one here is survival excitation. Okay, nearly done. Um, is this one of the CTGs? No, it's not. No, no. We're not done yet. Right. Yeah. So, Lana, 19-year-old female, is concerned about an incident with her boyfriend. Um, they noticed that her condom broke. So she's not concerned at the time, but now, and but she's not on any other form of contraception. So she's worried about her pregnancy, about being pregnant. So it's now been four days. What's the best option of emergency contraception? Yeah. <laughs> Alright, we're starting to see two on Saturday. We have um, just a few more questions. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, maybe we can ask them if they want to finish. I think we should. We only have a few more people who most likely want to finish. That's why I can ask. Like, maybe we can, we can, no, we can, we can ask them. Like, we've got four questions left. Do you guys want to say anything? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll ask. A lot of people did that. Wow. Okay, go back. Okay, so um, for emergency contraception, you have uh, well, really, you have three options because this one's not available in the uh, in Australia. Uh, so out of these three, um, the only ones that can be used up to five days are uh, Ulipristal and COP IUD. Um, and there's no evidence to suggest which one's more superior, basically. So both of them are viable options um, in this case. Does that make sense? So we got to go to the next question. Was that a question? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I see what you're getting at. Um, I guess, uh, so the main thing is that both of them are equally good. That's what we're getting at. Um, I guess, it, realistically, in, uh, in real life, you'd probably give her Euler Crystal, maybe. Um, but evidence-wise, you would, I think, both are viable options. And the other option with the uh, copper IUD is um, you can keep it in for long term, whereas that's just a one-off use. And so that might be good in someone who's young as well. Um, yeah, and there was another point I want to make. If you go back to the notes, um, yeah. Oh, and with the um, 
this one here, uh, that gets influenced by your BMI, so whereas these ones don't, so that's they're much more appealing options as well. Oh, we have, I think we have four more questions. Do you guys want to finish now or are you happy to stick around? Stick around? Okay. Uh, six year old. Yeah. Both, both of them are, are good options. options, not both. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't really, because the other two are more effective anyway. It's just one of the options that you have. Well, the crystal's a new thing. Yeah. So, in so the before past, that, yeah. Before that, we used levonorgestrel. Nowadays, not as much of a debate. We mainly do one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. I hear people. So, um, it's right. people have answered. Yeah. yeah. So we start by, so technically we're perfectly on time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like actually though, right? I think so. I just didn't think it would take us two hours. Yeah. I know, yeah. Makes sense. In the yeah. past, like people only have like 30 questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll just, I'll just do this thing. Yeah, very good. Um, so she's got risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia being uh, nilipirish, she's a high BMI, um, history of PCOS, uh, and in a, um, yeah. Um, so in uh, post-menopausal women, uh, an endometrial thickness less than five is normal, so she's, her ones were seven or eight, I think, so that's um, too high. Um, and so the first line therapy is a marina. So first line therapy for endometrial carcinoma is like surgery, right? But in this particular instance, it will be my renal, yeah. Next question. Oh, uh, so I think we might have the question, so. What's up? No, sorry, sorry. What are you thinking about? Don't. Uh, oh, CTG is yours. Okay, it's mine. So this is a CTG question, which you might get in the exam as well. A 23-year-old G2P1 woman is attending the hospital for a scheduled checkup at term. She's concerned that she doesn't feel like, uh, doesn't feel movement as many, as many movements from her baby as much over the past week. So her CTG is shown. What is the description for this? Hard question. It's it's proper. As well, so, okay, okay. What do you reckon? I don't know, I didn't, I didn't actually do these questions. Um, forty people. Should we turn up at 10? Is this the comment? Yeah. And that is your CTG on top. Yeah, but it's just the checkup. check out. How, how are these peaking? Which is the contracting? Which oh, is contracting? My bad, my bad, my bad. Yeah. Yeah, we want you to Yeah, yeah. Can I go back? Yeah. Yeah, just Yeah. So I explain this at the end. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we have to, sorry. Wait, no, yeah. So now, um, so this was a previous question as well. So her vitals are stable and she's had a slow but steady progress across the 
partogram. So this is her recent CTG. Is that number? Is that 180? Hmm? <coughs> oh, 150, yeah. These are the last questions, right? We're done then. Oh, is this last one? I don't know. I think you had three. We'll have one. I thought I had two. But yeah. Oh, we have one more slide. Do you want to switch back? Yeah. Wait for oh, no, no, no. It's finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so unlikely to have fetal compromise. Yep. Okay, so now for the explanation. So CTGs are very important, obviously, for explanation, but they can come up in the exam as well. So this here is from prompt again. Um, so, and these are the criteria that are would be valuable to remember. So unlikely to be associated with fetal compromise. Variable D cells without complicating features are a criteria are considered to be unlikely to be associated with fetal compromise. So that's what we had for the previous question. These are, oh, it, well, I guess like it's a bad picture, but I tried to find one with, and maybe that was my bad, but I tried to find one with better variability. But see, for example, though, in this one, right? For example, in this one, you can't see any variability either. Because it's overshooting. Yeah, I guess that is very Okay. Weird. No, yeah, sorry, you're right, you're right. Yeah, I, I didn't see that. Made this last night. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's correct, that's correct. But if there wasn't any complicating features, then it would be unlikely to have fetal compromise. But things like complicated variable would be maybe associated, and late D cells would be, um, again, maybe, late D cells without other complicating factors. So um, the main thing you have to remember is the first, this one, and this one. Um, so if you have complicated variable accelerations and reduced variability, then you need an urgent cesarean. And if you've got late D cells and reduced variability, then you also need an urgent cesarean, which was the case in this question, where we had late D cells. And I know these are bad questions. I tried to find best I could to find like good CTGs, but it's very difficult sometimes. Um, but another thing I want to note as well, prolonged bradycardia for more than five minutes is also an indication for cesarean. Yep. Cool. So that's the end of the question. Oh, we have a question. Yeah, yeah no, that will. It's just um, I, I avoided like trying to give as much clinical. It's just that um, this uh, this is actually based off previous questions where they have just gone like showed you the CTG and they tell you, they ask you like unlikely may or probably. So this is actually a, but if adapted this, from a past question. If the question. CTG shows this kind of stuff, then the clinical picture most likely coincides with that as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well. Yeah. They yeah. won't, they won't give you. Yeah. Um, um, so we've got some other questions that we didn't get to cover today. So we're going to uh, post that as a supplementary pack that you guys can do in your own time as well. Um, and yeah. So some tips, Basically, you know, you've got your written exam coming in, in a couple of months. So what you got to do is obviously start practice questions now. It'd be a good idea to start practice, practice questions early because as you can see, like, you know, you only find out a lot of the gaps in knowledge when you do the practice questions because oftentimes what you study at through clinical rotation is not the same as what is asked on the exam. And to do this, the best way to study is to go from prompt. And a lot of times it seems like really annoying to go through all like the nitty gritty um, of prompt. And there's always, it seems like there's a lot to read, but uh, it's, it's, it's a valuable time spent if you spend a you know, few hours here and there just reading like some of the other, all the, or some of the other guidelines. Um, for your OSCEs, obviously you should be practicing multiple times a week. So do it three or more times with you know, a bunch of mates or anything. And um, in the past, what I've done with my friends is 
we've written stems for each other and we've run OSCE sessions. So, you know, we run it like as official as we can. One person will do four and then the other person does four, you know, so then you get eight done in total. And then you'll like repeat that as many times as you want to do. Um, and another good thing is you can also practice for your OSCEs not by practicing, or by, but by writing notes. So a lot of times it's a good idea to like just have a sheet of paper and write down the common presenting complaints and list out the questions you would ask for these comp uh, presenting complaint, you know, for the differential diagnoses of question. And um, that's another way to study for it. Um, so if you start working now, you won't have to cram or everything before the exam. So it will, obviously it's a good idea to get started early. And honestly, like, these are very difficult questions. I just want to, like, emphasize. So, like, I mean, obviously, if you can answer some of these, that's fine. Because, honestly, like, at this stage in the year, I probably wouldn't be able to answer, like, many of these. So, uh, give yourself also enough time to relax, um, chill. Because, you know, fourth year is not the end of it. And honestly, like, your Z score only determines what, like, internship you get. After that, you know, anything can determine, you know, what happens in your career. So, yeah. That's all. Uh, if you guys haven't studied these, study these. We do things. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to leave these up. Leave these up just so you can, if you guys are interested.